I would like y'all first of all to be in uh, Matthew 28. We'll look at the story before we get into the main message. We have today as many children here as we do adults. So half of the church is going back there. <laughs> uh, Matthew 28, and we're going to look at uh, the resurrection part, and then I want to get into some specifics, some essentials as to what the resurrection has done for us, for mankind. And we're going to be looking at some keys. A key is something that unlocks, it gives access to. And we're going to look at some resurrection keys. Father, as we look at your word this morning, we pray that the Logos becomes the rhema to our hearts. That your spirit speaks to us, especially in ways, Lord, that each of us need a word from you today. We thank you that we're here today to take this communion in memory of what Jesus did for us, the suffering in his body and his soul, and giving to us the wonderful, saving, powerful, resurrected life. And thank you, Lord Jesus. And now, Lord, we just pray the Holy Spirit takes the word and gives us the truth out of it. In Jesus' precious name, and everybody else said? Amen. Praise the Lord. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to, to the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door that sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. For fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not. Ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. Praise God. As he had said, come and see the place where the Lord uh, had laid, and go quickly and tell the disciples that he is risen. There's your first missionaries, your first witnesses, your first ambassadors right there of the gospel message. Go and tell his disciples, that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, and there shall you see him. Lo, I have told you so. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples a word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. And then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go and tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there they shall see me. I'm going to have a divine appointment, a divine meeting with the Lord Jesus, just like we all did when we got first saved. Now, I want us to look at some things, if you will, uh, go over to 1 Peter, and we're going to look at some keys to the resurrection and what the resurrection has done for us. The first one we're going to look at is the new birth. Uh, you've heard me say this many times and I'll say it many more times because so many people in America today are trusting in something else other than Jesus to be the Savior that takes them to heaven. So many folks trust in their baptism, their church membership or doing good or some kind of religious experience and thinking that that will give them uh, eternal life and take them to heaven. But there's only one way to heaven, and that's to be born again, to have a new birth. And for that to happen, we have to have a conviction in our life that we need a Savior, and His name is Jesus. So, uh, Peter mentions some things here in 1 Peter 1. We'll read from verses 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy has begotten us. Now that's the same word for born again. It's the same Greek rendering. Has begotten us again unto a living hope 
The hope that we have is a hope of life, eternal life. By, and here's what it is, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. I don't know about you, but I got reservations. And my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life through the precious blood of Jesus. And I got a place waiting for me in God's abode, heaven. Amen. Praise the Lord. Who are kept, now this is a miracle who are kept by the power of God, that's the dunamis, the dunamis, the explosive power of the Lord, the miracle power of the Lord, through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So the first resurrection key is the new birth. And uh, that happens, and it's an essential thing because there's a point in time in our lives where we meet God at the foot of the cross. And what we want to receive is new life. And Jesus gives that to us through his resurrection. You know, without the resurrection, the crucifixion would not have done the deal for us. It took the crucifixion and the resurrection. Because you see, the gospel message is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So all of that he fulfilled. But you and I could not receive the saving, powerful, resurrected life of Jesus if he hadn't have been resurrected. And the reason he was resurrected, because he was the Son of God that never sinned, never did anything wrong. And he was willing to come down from heaven and take the punishment that we should have received for our sins. Jesus took it on himself. He took all the evil, all the hell, all of your sins of, of the whole history, from the beginning time to the end of time, he took it on not just his body. Last Sunday we were talking about the crucifixion of Christ at Isaiah 53. He also suffered in his soul. People don't realize Jesus died two things. He died in his body and he died in his soul. Did you know there was a point in time when Jesus cried out to the Father God, Why have you forsaken me? And the earth was blackened because at that time Jesus had taken and became sin for us who knew no sin. 2 Corinthians 5 talks about that. You and I will never know the aloneness that Jesus experienced. The Father God, the Holy Spirit, and the Lord Jesus in the spiritual realm at that moment rejected Jesus as it were because he had become sin. I don't really understand that, but I know this. If he hadn't done that, I'd be in hell. I would have no destiny but hell. And anybody listening to me today, if you don't have the real Jesus Christ living in your spirit and born again in you, you will not go to heaven. I don't care how many churches you have members, membership on or how many times you've been baptized by different churches, without having Jesus Christ living in your human spirit, you will not go to heaven. You, will, you don't have eternal life. And so many people have a false uh, a life that they think is from Jesus. You know how you can tell the difference? The life of Jesus in you is a love life of God. And his desire is always to please the Lord, not self-love, not just living for self anymore. I did it for a long time. I played church thinking I was going to heaven, baptized at an early age. And God woke me up one day. You talk about the woke movement. My woke movement is from God. And he woke me up to realize you're sitting in a church, just playing church, and you need to be born again. My wife got a new husband and my kids got a new dad because I was no longer just a Baptist, just a denominational member. I became a member of the family of God of heaven and my destiny. And God changed me so much that I, I got out of the funeral business and got into the ministry. Now, that, God's got to have a sense of humor to take you from undertaking to uppertaking. Amen. Huh? Amen. And uh, us guys that's funeral directors, we, we're kind of hard because we see a lot of stuff. We see a lot of stuff that 
the society doesn't see, and it kind of makes you hard. But you know what? Mm -hmm. God can break the most hardest heart that you've ever seen and tenderize that heart with Jesus, giving him the life of Christ. Praise the Lord. So we got resurrected from the dead. You see, every person that gets born again by the Spirit of Jesus has a resurrection. And then you're guaranteed later on another resurrection that when you die, your body is the only thing that's going to die. Your spirit and your soul is very much alive and going to be in the immediate presence of Jesus. And someday there's going to be a rapture or resurrection, whichever one comes first for us. Some of us uh, may go in the rapture. Some of us may, may go uh, and, and die first and wind up uh, going through the resurrection that route. But you know what? doesn't matter how that goes. The main thing is to be with Jesus. Amen? Do any of y'all want to be left behind? No. Well, then you better get it right with the Lord. I always tell people, if you have any doubt about it, you ought to get on your knees and say, Lord, I'm not sure if I'm saved or not. But I want to know it for sure. I want to know that I know that I know that when I die, I'm going to be in heaven. And if there's any doubt about that, I wouldn't leave this building today without knowing that Jesus Christ is truly your personal Lord and Savior. And it's very simple. You ask him to come in. A lot of people say, well, I believe. You see in John 1, 12, it says it's not just enough to believe. You've got to receive what you believe. You see what I mean? You can have it up here like I did, but I didn't have it in here. But brothers and sisters, when you get on the personal level with God, you say, Lord, I want Jesus Christ to take over my life. I want him to be my boss. That's what Lord means, to be your boss. And he comes in, he invades every area of your life with himself. And he changes you. That's how I know a person's been born again, and truly saved. They've been changed. A divine change took place. I mean, their goals change, their attitude changes. Everything about them changes. Their thinking. I mean, it's just wonderful what God does to us. And that brings me to the next point, of the next key. He gives to us a living, everlasting hope. I mean, it is a heavenly hope. It's, it's his life coming in to live in us. It's an inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, and fades not away that's reserved in heaven for us. Praise the Lord. Now, I want you to go over to uh, Colossians. I'm looking for a city where I'll never die. You know, that old song is really true. Someday I'm going to experience the new Jerusalem. Brand new Jerusalem. A heavenly Jerusalem. And a heaven that is eternal. That's where I'm headed. Don't get too comfortable down here on this earth. This is temporary. We're being designed for a better place and eternal life with God in heaven. Can anybody say praise the Lord? I mean, that's something to ju uh, jump up and down about. All right, Colossians 3, and when we look at uh, verses 1 to 3, and this is the key to the right kind of life. There's two ways to live. You can live unrighteously or you can live righteously. You can live uh, in holy goodness or you can live in total evil. Every human being has a free will and they choose which way they're going to live. And you can't blame God, you can't blame Satan, you can't blame family or anybody else except yourself. Everybody has a choice to make. Yes to Jesus or no to Jesus. Uh, Colossians 3 and verses 1 to 3. If then you be risen with Christ. You see that right there? That's a resurrection. Have you been resurrected by Jesus? How do you know? You've changed. You got a new destiny. It's no longer King Self. It's King Jesus. If you then be risen with Christ, seek, aha, uh -huh, 
evidence of real life. What are you seeking with your life? Who's your shepherd? Everybody has something they follow. Everybody in life is seeking something. What is it? I hope it's God. And how do you get to know God? You get to know him through Jesus Christ, his son. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. And there he's talking about heavenly. Setting your will. Uh, this is an important thing. Set your will to seek God every day. Matthew 6, is a verse about that, seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things he'll, he'll give to you. You see, the kingdom of God is his authority. Now here's the question. Whose authority are you obeying during your daily life? There's only two. God's authority and Satan's authority. There's the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and there's the kingdom of darkness. And every human being in this world today is living in one of those kingdoms and for one of those kingdoms. But if you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. And you know a beautiful thing about that statement? In Ephesians 2, 6, it talks about us as believers, us as the church is seated with Jesus at the right hand of the throne of God. Did you know you're seated there? In God's mind, we're there. We're, there, we're with Him. Amen? Amen. It kind of changes your perspective of how you want to live your life if you know I'm with Jesus and He's with me and we are in His kingdom and I'm seated with Him on the throne. I'm on this earth, but yet in the spiritual realm, I'm with Him seated at the right hand of God. Don't understand all that, but the scripture says it's so. All right, here again is the choice of your will. Now, let me tell you something about your will. You either have a surrendered will to God or you have an unsurrendered will to God. You can't straddle the fence. A lot of people trying to live with one foot in heaven and one foot on the earth that don't work that way. I don't know about you, but I want every portion of my being to be with God now and forever. Because nothing down here is going to last. Did you know everything down here someday is going to be burned up by the fire of God? I heard somebody say one time all God had to do was split to Adam. Everything will change. And it's going to happen. Set your affection. Your affection are your, your feelings and your thinking and, and all those things about, about you as a person. Uh, set your affection on self-love. <laughs> what did the scripture say? The things above. Talking about heavenly things. Not on the things of the earth. Do you know something? Spiritually dead people have no desire for heaven. Their desire is only for what the world can give to them. And Satan and the demons throw everything in the world at them, say, try this and this. This will give you fulfillment. This will give you purpose. This will give you meaning. Try this and this and this and this. And they, the, the, the kingdom of darkness bait you with all kinds of junk out there to distract you, to pull your affections away from anything except evil. Did you know that? It's like a magnet being pulled at you. That's what keeps people lost. That's what keeps people, uh, Christians that get backslidden, they've taken the bait. They pull away from the Lord. And they're walking with the world. And when we see that happen, we need to pray and intercede. God, break them. Show them what they're doing. They're, they're bringing shame on Jesus and his blood. Break them and bring them back into the fold. Amen. Don't Condemn me critical. Uh, the world gives enough of that to everybody. Be loving and forgiving and encouraging. Because that might be you someday. It might be me someday. Did you know? I don't care how high up you get with the Lord, you can fall. Just like that. And I've seen many a preacher and evangelist fall and destroy their lives and ruin not only their testimony, but they're actually ruining the testimony of Jesus before the world. And it's sad that that happens. But you got to keep check on your affections. You got new affections in Jesus, but you got the old 
uh, old life, the old Adam, the old self, affections of the devil. And they're at war with you all the time. And you're thinking and you're doing. There's always that pull. Which one am I going to obey? Well, which one do you love the most? That's the one you're going to obey. It's what you set your affections on. Set your affection on the things above, not on the things of the earth. For you are dead. Now he's talking about your old life. Your old sin nature was crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20 talks about this. I mention that verse all the time because Christians have got to have an encounter with Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And I live this life by faith through the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What's the emphasis there? Death to your sick ego. I even see so many Christians, and many of them in ministry, they're driven by a sick ego to pamper self and want affections drawn to themselves. Listen, we're not to be drawn anybody to us. We're to be drawn people to Jesus Christ. I mean, we're not living here for self. We're living here for Jesus. When were we going to get that serious and say, Lord, I need to live for you and quit living for me? And when you live for Jesus, the living for self will work out because look, Jesus will be Lord of all of the self life. You see what I mean? Because the things you're going to do during the day are your normal activities. But don't let that be your king and your rule. So many of us have turned our minds and our affections over to other things and things control us other than Jesus. And folks, when other things control us other than Jesus, we've got an idol in our life. We let something else disturb our relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? And I see Christians do it all the time. I can do it. I can even do it with preaching and studying and things like that and make that an idol instead of Jesus. Do you, can you imagine that? But that's how subtle the devil is. He can do that. And we have to be careful with our affections because our old self was crucified with Christ and it's no longer I that live, it's He, it's He that lives in me and now everything is about Him because He's Lord and I'm not. I'm His servant, I'm His priest and He's the high priest. That's what the scripture says. For you are dead and your, your life is hidden with Christ in God. I want to ask you a question. When you're out here in the world, do people see any evidence in your life that you belong to Jesus? What are they hearing and what are they seeing out of your life? You see, we are left in this world to be divine reflectors of the character of Jesus Christ, not that old sin nature. They have that, they see that, and, and let me tell you something, when they see that in a local church, do you think they're going to attend that local church when that is full of a bunch of people that just live for self and not Jesus? I will guarantee you they're getting that out in the world. Why do they want to come to church and get it? Can anybody say hello? Somebody said no, goodbye. Not yet. Now, I don't have this written down here, but I want to emphasize verse 4 because it's important. When Christ, who is our life, now this is a question for you. Is Christ really and truly your life, your reason for living? If not, why not? When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. That's my goal. That's where I want to be. When Jesus comes back, either in the rapture, the second coming, whatever the case may be, wherever we're at at the time, I'm going to be with him forever. <laughs> Think about it. I don't have to be concerned about my body that's dying. You see, the older you get, the more you see your body is going to pop. And the more you see the world is going to hell faster and faster. And your mind is always in a battle between good and evil out here in the world and in your affections. The question is, right now in your life, who is controlling your life, your thinking, your affections, your emotions? 
If you are giving yourself over to something else and you're just all the time thinking about it and it's controlling you, guess what? You're not in the will of God anymore. You've got an idol. And I'll, I'm going to tell you what I believe it is. I believe it's a demon. I don't care how long you've been a Christian. I believe a demon can come and influence your life and start controlling you in the area of your life that controls you. And guess what? You're no longer walking in true fellowship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You're walking in fellowship with an idol that you have let come in your life. Uh, I, I'll, I'll be frank with you. With all this stuff that's going on in, in our society and in America today, uh, something that I, I had to admit to myself, because my wife would tell me all the time, there was a certain news media that I would watch because I felt like they had more truth than anybody else. Because I knew all the rest of them were nothing but liars. They got a Jezebel spirit, a, a, uh, a ruling spirit. So actually a witchcraft spirit that's in control in America right now. And I was getting caught up in it and didn't realize it. Because I was allowing this channel to control my mind and I was getting so frustrated I could even feel at times my blood pressure going up. I became addicted. Just like that. It was like I was on a drug. And here I was. It, it disturbed me from walking with God. It disturbed me from hearing God. It disturbed me from the Word of God. Because all I had on my mind was all this junk that was going on and they're feeding it across the news media. And the problem is, I believe most Americans, because most of them are not in church and most of them have never been born again, they are taking all these lies hook, line, and sinker and they're believing all the lies of hell that's coming through that stuff. That's why our country is in the, the condition it is today and I blame that on the church. And I'm going to tell you why I blame that on the church. The church has not been preaching the the real gospel to people anymore. They water it down so you just feel good about yourself and go, warm, ho go home warm and be filled with that stuff. And consequently, there's no content of the Lordship of Christ in people's lives. There's no content in depthness of the Word of God in their lives. And so what's ruling their mind and ruling life is the junk they're letting come in their head. Amen? I wish, I wish to God that Christians would spend more time in the Word of God than they do on the, the iPhone, the iPad, and, and all the other eye stuff that they got. I still use a flip phone. So I'm not addicted to all that other stuff everybody else is. And the kids, you can't even talk to them. They're playing these games on these things. They don't have uh, conversation with people anymore. Amen? Amen? Well, that's beginning to affect the church. And the church affects what goes on in the nation. And the church is weak and watered down. We have failed to reach people. We failed to reach people in Washington, D.C., in all of our state capitals, in our governments everywhere. We just let the devil's crowd take over. And we say, well, there's nothing I can do. I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to bring this back to this point. The resurrection of Jesus Christ can make a difference. How many people do you know of out there, and you, including yourself and myself, how many of us ever talk about the resurre resurrection of Jesus Christ to the people out here in the world? They'll think you're nuts. But that's what they need. They need a resurrection. They need the resurrection of Jesus Christ's life to come into their life. Amen? Now, all that to say this, I'm, I'm, I was emphasizing the point to a right life, the key to right life. And it comes from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? Whew. That's so heated up. Uh, the next one I want to look at is... Uh, uh, go to 1 Thessalonians 4. And there's a verse there I want to show you. The resurrection of Jesus Christ's life in you comes to you to comfort you and encourage you in the time of trouble. Now listen to me. You've either been in trouble, or you're in trouble right now, or you're going to be in trouble. That's the way life is. Amen? Now, the way the world handles trouble is through, like, drugs, alcohol, 
uh, money, uh, sex, or, or whatever it is the world's got out there, uh, that's how they handle trouble and problems and all that. And uh, I just don't know. And of course, a lot of uh, people nowadays are committing suicide. They have no hope. Well, the Bible tells us there is hope. But quit going to the world and listen to the devil for hope because the devil and the world's not going to give you any hope. They're out to destroy you. All right, and um, I'm not over there yet. What are you doing, boy? I need to be in 1 Thessalonians 4. Now, these verses that I'm about to give to you, I have used at a lot of graveside funerals because I take the Scripture through the anointing of the Holy Spirit to give people some hope and some comfort in the worst time of their life. The worst time in a person's life is the death of a loved one. I mean, it just rakes your heart. It just, it just tears you up. And the scriptures can give you some hope and some comfort. But I want, I would not have you uh, to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep as physical death, that you sorrow not as others who have no hope, or the word might be grief, grieve not of others who have no hope. Now, he shows you where to put your hope in the next verse. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Man, there's the resurrection again. You see? Rose again. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede or prevent them which are also asleep. And he's talking about um, really the, the body. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. He's not going to send the angels back for us. He says, I'm coming. I'm coming. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first, resurrection. You know what the word shout means? It's a Greek word for the summons of a court. A summons has your name on it. Before I, I got real old, I used to get jury summons, and I don't get them anymore because I go to sleep trying to listen to all that junk they're talking about. <laughs> But anyway, I want you to know, my name, my name has got a summons from God. And the promise is given to me, my name's going to be called out. Why? Because it's already written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Is yours? Do you know it for sure? And he says, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Now that's a word, when you start studying the, the Greek rendering, the Latin rendering of that word is, uh, has to do with rapture, a taking out, a snatching away. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. So the dead in Christ and then the alive in Christ, when the rapture comes, are going to meet the Lord in the air, in the atmosphere of the air. What a day that will be. I get to see a lot of my family again forever. It's a heavenly reunion, eternal heavenly reunion. Resurrection. We're going to meet them in the clouds and the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So what should I do with these words? The Bible says, comfort one another with these words. What gives us that comfort? The resurrection. You know, a lot of funerals that I've had through the years that people didn't believe, they actually believe this that when their loved one died or when they die and they are put in that ground, that that's it. It's over. That's not true. The Bible teaches there's eternal life, some to heaven and some to a place called hell. So when a person dies, immediately they're either in one or the other place. 
There is no in between. I don't care what people believe. It don't matter what they believe. If they don't believe the Word of God, the Word of God is going to be fulfilled because it's God's Word, it's His will, and it will be fulfilled. Just because, well, I don't believe that. You know what? You will someday. Because the Bible says this, Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess to the glory of God that Jesus Christ is Lord. So that means you're going to wind up in hell, but you're still going to believe that every knee is going to... The Bible says you're going to confess it, that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know what? Because they're going to face Him as judge. It talks about that in Revelation, the white throne judgment. Christians are going to face Him at the Bema seat of Christ for the stuff we did as a Christian, which a lot of that... Huh. was called Christian, but not Christian at all. Uh-oh, now you're stepping on my toes. I might be on your knees here in a minute. So there's comfort then in the resurrection because the Lord is coming down himself. You know, one of the words for the Holy Spirit, paraclete, is the Holy Comforter. Just at the moment you need a word from God, the Holy Spirit comes alongside and you feel Him. And He speaks inside and He gives you comfort and peace. Where'd that come from? It wasn't from the devil. And it wasn't from yourself. It was from Jesus. He said, I will never leave you and I will never, ever forsake you. That word is like being out in the desert all by yourself with no hope. Jesus says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. In the worst times of our life, he's in the middle of it with us. Did you know that? Now, the devil comes along with a little demon and says, wait a minute. That's not true. Look at what you're going through. Look what Jesus went through the cross. Look what the disciples go through. Everybody is going to go through bad times. But the Bible declares a promise. I am with you, and I'm not going to leave you. Next time you get depressed and you think about nobody cares, there's nobody else in this world uh, that's going through this, and, you know, I'm, I'm just going through this, and, and I just can't take it anymore. You know what? Quit letting a demon lie to you. You know what you can tell those demons, don't you? Go to hell. <gasps> that's where they came from. That's where they're going. Amen? But let me tell you how to work on them. This is what they'll hear. Say, in the name and the blood of Jesus... I cast you out of my life. I cast you away from me and quit hostile, bringing hostile to me and quit tormenting me in my mind. You're a lying spirit and I'm not going to believe you anymore. I'm running to Jesus. Keep the focus of your life on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, Hebrews 12, 2. Quit letting demons minister to you. All angels are lying, I mean, all angels are ministers, but some of them are lying ministers and some of them are truth ministers. Gods are truth ministers. Satans are lying ministers. All demons lie. Amen? Now here's something else. You know, stuff's just popping in my head. I guess somebody needs to hear this. Every time Get this, that we lie and we know we're lying, you just spoke for a demon. Oh, how about the little bitty white lies? They're not from heaven. If they're not from heaven, where's it coming from? Hell. The white ones? Where'd they get that term anyway? Listen. A lie is a lie, and truth is truth. That's what we should be teaching our children. What are you teaching them? Hello? Just something to think about. 
All right, I need to go to this last point, and oh, this is something we're supposed to be doing. In Acts 4, the resurrection gives to us an effective witness. Here, several Sundays ago, I was talking to you about the mission of the local church, the mission of uh, God's people out here in the world. And the main mission, Jesus says, come and follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. So our main mission in life is to tell people about Jesus, to be a witness, to be an ambassador, to hand tracts out, Bibles out, to win people to Christ which I'm told by the modern day church, that's old fashioned. That they do it a new way now, they do it through marketing. Well, my question is, can you show me in the Bible what you're talking about? Hello? And here's the deal. In Acts 4, now, Peter and the disciples were always, after they got filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, they were always about obeying the Great Commission. Now, Christian, listen to me. If you are not obeying the Great Commission, you're committing sin in your life. I don't know if you've never heard that before. You, you say you're a Christian and you say you're going to heaven and you say you invited Jesus to come in your life as your Lord and Savior. Well, then I want to see that that's real by your witnessing with the way you live and that when God puts people in front of you who need a word of encouragement, a prayer, or perhaps even being led to Christ to become Lord and Savior, that you're a missionary and you're available and you're right there to be God's witness that you'll do it. Because so many people today, and let me tell you what I get from a lot of people today, I don't have time. I want to hear you say that to Jesus when you face him. I don't, I just didn't have time. Well, it, it might cost me some money. You can give all the excuses you want. If you are not witnessing you're in sin against Jesus because he gave a command. It was not a suggestion. He gave a command to come and follow him. That's discipleship to be his witnesses. And he's going to show you about leading people to Christ. That's why we're here. You're not here for self. You're to be his witness. And so in verse uh, 33 of chapter 4, of course, they're going through persecution. They're telling them, don't, don't go out here in the streets in public and speak anymore in the name of Jesus, and especially don't talk about the resurrection of the gospel. And with great power, now that's that Greek word dunamos, which is God's explosive miracle work, miracle power, gave he to the, to the apostles to witness. What were they witness of? Now, underline this in your Bible. This is one of the things that we always should be mentioning, the witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and great grace was upon them all. Now, the question is, how do we tell somebody about the resurrection? Well, you give them the full gospel message. You say this, somebody, somebody and I've had this asked me before, can you tell me about God? Or somebody will say, can you tell me about this Jesus that you're talking about? And especially they'll, they'll mention, well, I don't believe there can be a resurrection because if you're dead, you're dead. You can't be resurrected. But did you know in Romans, I believe it's Romans 10, 9, talks about one of the essentials of a person believing in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is they must believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ because we're not serving a dead savior. The crosses you see all in these buildings around here, they don't have a corpse on it. You know why? Our Jesus is alive today. He's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. 
and I'm serving a risen Savior. Amen? With great power. Now, I want to close by giving to you, you cannot go out here in this world and be a witness. First of all, you've got to be born again. Secondly, you've got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, if you would submit yourself to the authority of God and obey His Word and say, Lord, I want to learn how to witness. I want to learn who is it that you want me to tell somebody about Jesus. He'll show you. But here's what he said in Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power. That's an anointing of the Holy Spirit. After the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now, he didn't say you might or maybe. I want you to notice the emphatic word that he used here. You shall be witnesses. Did you hear that? Every born-again Christian, and you're submitted to the Lord, you want God to use you, He's going to fill you and use you, and He says, You shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, that's where you're living, wherever you're at, your family, the area you're living, and that's your Jerusalem, and Judea, then it's out from that area to other areas, and Judea and Samaria. Samaria were uh, like mixed people. Most of them were like half Gentile and half Jew. So that means the witness of Christ in us and through us is to go to every culture, every skin color, Jesus died on the cross for every human being. And then he said, to the uttermost part of the earth. That's why we have missionaries and we have missions. We have them in the States, in North America, uh, and we have them all over the world. That's the mandate, the commission that we have from God to take that word to everybody. Now, I'm going to tell you what I do. I was taught by this, by our pastor that taught us young preacher boys back in the early 70s in Corpus, always have tracks on your person or in your purse to be able to hand the Word of God to somebody so they can take the Word home with them. Sometimes, I've seen many times that God has used that to open a door up. Sometimes I'll have my Navy cap on from being a veteran, and people will come up and greet me and thank me, and I'll give them a track. The one I'm using right now is God is greater than any problem you have. Did you know that track in this county has been going out by the thousands? They're in the stores and cafes and everywhere you go. I'm getting more and more input from that one track than any I've handed out in all these 40 some odd years because it's a powerful message. People right now are hurting. People are fearful. People need God right now. They don't need a pseudo God. They don't need an entertainment God. They need a real God, and it's Jesus Christ. That's what they need. And we have the message, but we have to be telling it. We have to be putting it out there. And if there was less of self and more of Him, we would be witnessing more and winning more people to Christ. That's just a fact. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Does your life testify to the reality that Jesus Christ's resurrection is real in you? Have you been changed by the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Have you really been changed? If you really believe the resurrection is real, are you submitted to it in its entirety? Because there's all types of resurrections that God wants us to encounter while we're living this life on the earth. I call them rhemas. Rhemas are a spoken word from the Word of God into our heart and spirit at any given time. Some of you may have gotten some right here today. Those are resurrections. He's resurrecting you from being just a nominal worldly Christian to becoming a spirit-filled Christian. Or maybe you're a spirit-filled Christian. Now he wants you to go on and really start witnessing and winning people to Christ. Be active. 
These are resurrections. These rhemas are resurrections. All through our Christian life, we're experiencing the resurrection life of Jesus Christ. Amen? And if we're not, there's something wrong with our relationship with Jesus. You ever thought about it? Where are you with God today? Where's your walk at? Are you available? Are you usable for the Lord? I hope so. And I hope maybe right now if you're pondering that and you're not really sure that before today is over with, you'll do some business with the Lord and get things right. Now, you're going to get a chance right now because we're going to take Holy Communion, which is the Lord's Supper. Now, I use the word holy because it's supposed to be pure, sanctified, and set apart for God. You see, with the Lord, now think about this. We're taking this juice and this wafer as a symbol of the body and blood of Jesus, what he did for us on the cross. I don't believe God takes it lightly when you just kind of do it traditionally, like some people do it every week, some people do it once a month, some people do it once every three months. I don't see anywhere in the Bible where it's got a specific time, but here's the deal. Jesus said this in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, when you do it, do it in memory of me, and when you do it, take it worthily. In other words, without known sin in your life. Some of us have little pet sins that we think, well, I can go ahead and take this Lord's Supper, you know, and this thing I got down inside of me. And I'll tell you one of the biggest ones I have found amongst Christians through the years is unforgiveness. I don't know what it is about forgiving people that people have a hard time doing, but they just can't seem to let some things go. They just hold on to it hold on to it. And every time we hold on to something that we fail to forgive, it's a slap in Jesus' face. It's as if his resurrection wasn't enough to take care of that problem. And people sitting here today, I'll guarantee you there's somebody here today that's got a grudge against somebody else. They hold it and hold it and hold it and it's just like an irritation in their life. It's like an irritation on their soul. There's, they know there's not complete peace in them. They don't have complete joy because there's still this thorn that keeps sticking them. You don't know what they said. You know what they did. You know what? Jesus does, and he died for it. Why are you holding on to it? You see, you make them a prisoner and you make yourself a prisoner by not letting go of it. And I'll have people, well, I forgive them. I, I, I'll go up, I hug them and, and, and I do this and do that. I said, that's superficial. My, my question is, your heart and God's heart, way deep down inside of you, are you still holding on? You see, we play games with God where nobody can see it. I can fake it, not with God. God sees you through and through. He knows you through and through. And if there's anybody here today, and I'll tell you how, one of the evidences that people don't forgive, they're very sensitive. And they're touchy. And they don't take criticism well. In fact, they took offenses all the time. Everybody offends them. What's the root problem? You got some unforgiveness deep, deep, deep inside. So every head bowed and every eye closed. Father God, as we approach this sacred time with you, this time that's to be so pure, that Lord, we don't want to bring shame on Jesus' name, his life and his blood, by not confessing every known sin. And especially if somebody right now is convicted to receive the real Jesus into their life for real, they know it and they need to do it right now. Father, you deal with that heart. Maybe somebody doesn't have assurance 
that they've been saved, assurance of salvation, but right now they can get assurance by voicing to Jesus and say, Lord, I'm not sure. So right now I'm going to ask you to come into my life. And you said you'd forgive me of all my sins. So I, I turn myself over to you completely. That you touch me with that heavenly touch. That I know it. That I know that you came into my life. That I know you took all my sins away. You took all my past away. You took all the stuff that I held against people away. Because I surrender it to you right now. I let go of it. I don't want to hold on to this acid anymore. It's just eating me up. And Jesus, come in my life and take every area of my life over that you be Lord of it. And I thank you for it. Now for a few moments of silence, just do some business with the Lord before we take this communion, this Lord's Supper, and do it with the right heart. Jesus, how we thank you and praise you for loving us so much that you were willing to come to this earth and pour your life blood out on a wooden cross so we could have your eternal resurrected life and be with you in heaven forever. Thank you for your patience as you wait on us to surrender maybe for the first time to be born again, to surrender it all. Maybe another time now as a Christian that you've been holding on to something you know you've got to give up. And today is the day of surrender, deliverance, release. Thank Him for it. Thank Jesus for what He's done for you. Ask Him to fill you with His love by that anointing of His Spirit. And we praise you for your miracle work, for heaven coming down and moving into us that we can know you for real and walk with you for real. And we thank you for it in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said. Amen. All right. Uh, Ray, would you like to come help us? Amen. And uh, Johnny? Now, let me tell you about these, these new hygienically processed COVID-free. The top of this is a wafer, but it's got a separate seal to pull off of it first. And you pull that wafer out. Then it's got another seal for the juice. And so that's why we're going to let y'all just take these out of here and you hold on to them until we get ready. I'm going to get that one for me. Did you get one? Oh, okay. Did we miss anybody? No. Did everybody get one? Okay. You want? I tell you what. Let's let's let Ray pray. This. You want? Amen. Bless this.
Father God, this morning we just want to ask you, thank you for this opportunity to take uh, the bread of life and your blood. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, for as often as you do it, you do it for me. His bread, the bread is his body and the wine is his blood. The drink is his blood. Mm -hmm. So we want to thank Father, for the Father God today for allowing us to partake of his body and blood. And may it increase your knowledge, understanding of his grace and what he's plans for you and how much he loves you and how much he wants you to be a part of his life. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, you peel that off, get your wafer. And as they did eat, Jesus took the bread, he blessed it and broke it and gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. Never thought I'd be doing it like this. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. Praise the Lord. Did you know it is a wonderful heavenly privilege that Jesus instituted this institution, this ordinance, that we can participate in his life and have his life. That's why we're doing this. It, it reminds us of him and what he's done. And it should remind us that every day I need to be staying right with the Lord and being available for him. Amen? Amen. Now, if you two fellows will come back and take the offering plates up. Oh, I forgot to mention, uh, this Agenda 1, Agenda 2, uh, Grinding America Down, Masters of Deceit by Curtis Bowers is a documentary of what's going on in our nation. It's very good. I've had quite a few of these that's gone out to family and friends. This is another good one that I just got through with. You've probably heard him on radio and TV. Uh, Dr. Erwin Lutzer. He's at Moody Bible Institute, Moody Bible Church in uh, Chicago. We will not be silenced. Powerful book for today. We will not be silenced. And this is another one. Just got through with this one. He uses the Titanic as a uh, illustration of where the church is headed. The Titanic and today's church, the tale of two shipwrecks. It's where the church is headed and all through there he's showing uh, what happened to the Titanic and what's happening to the church by Warren B. Smith. Very good book. Johnny, would you uh, pray over this? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, day, Lord, and all these things. Lord, use the church in your honor, Lord, and Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You want to put that back on the desk and back there for me. Okay, thank you all for being here. Have a wonderful resurrection day. And don't eat too many eggs with those kids. <laughs>